talk about Japanese design uh, for the tea ceremony. And uh, we're launching Michael Freeman's new book. Um, he is a photographer, a very well-known photographer. Uh, apart from anything else, he's responsible for a book called The Photographer's Eye, which has sold over a million copies and has been published in 27 languages. And actually, he tells us that this is his 137th book. Um, and no doubt it's the best so far. Um, so uh, he'll be talking about his book, but just briefly um, before that, um, his publisher, uh, Mark Fletcher, is going to say a few words about the publishing company, um, eight books of which he is one of the two co-founders, along with Damien, who's sitting next to him. So I'll, I'll hand straight over to you then, Mark. Thank you very much. I just, just wanted to just say a little bit about how we came to um, publish this book. Um, I've worked in sort of mainstream publishing for rather too long, but the many of these sort of books, uh, these days illustrated books, they have to be on very, very general subjects. And, and, and publishing a book that's one would define as niche is harder and harder. And this book was something that um, Michael felt quite passionate about, and I thought would be a wonderful book as well, mainly because he'd done books on sort of design on general design, and then he, he showed me some of these tea ceremony rooms in Japan, and I thought it would be wonderful to, to create a book just showing, you know, 40 examples of these, these extraordinary interiors, which are sort of quite unique, and also very particular in their sense of their aesthetic, and that the, these are empty rooms that are done, that are basically designed for a ceremony. And uh, on the basis of that, we, we, we set up this, the company Eight Books, which we named um, as a sort of lucky number in Asia, and um, I'm very pleased that this is actually a new edition, it's an updated edition of this book, and um, I'm very pleased we are able to publish it again. So, over to Michael. So, good evening again. Um, this is actually one of the stranger projects that I became involved in. And you might rightly think that few things can be more esoteric than contemporary Japanese tea houses. I mean, tea houses themselves are among the most focused and, well, rule-bound spaces ever devised, and not to be tackled lightly, least of all by someone who knew absolutely nothing about them. Um, and I can't claim to know uh, a great deal more than that even now. But with the confidence of ignorance, uh, I went a step further and chose only contemporary ones, a sort of Japanese new wave. This, however, is what photography can encourage photographers to do. And as a photographer, I'm prone to the belief that, that my medium can, in some way, tackle everything because its language is different. So that's my excuse for um, the hubris of... of tackling this this subject and what you're looking at now of course is a, an entirely traditional uh, tea ceremony room and I should explain that part of my work not all of it is loosely architectural and I don't see myself as a fully committed architectural photographer um, most of the time I'm doing documentary reportage stories about people but I'm very interested in building that's on a human scale, meaning spaces designed for living rather than grand public statements. And this ultimately is what led me to photographing this collection of 40 contemporary tea houses. So at this point though I'd better start using the Japanese term chashitsu, um, which doesn't translate perfectly into English, mainly for our own English cultural reasons. I mean, tea house is fine, as long as the structure is freestanding, but when as often nowadays the space is inside a house or some other building, tea room is not really a very happy translation, conjuring, conjuring up, at least for me, thoughts of old-fashioned seaside towns and helpings of cucumber sandwiches and scones with jam. Um, but I first became interested in living space, human-scale space, in a project almost 30 years ago on the Shakers, in America. These were a utopian sect founded in New England in the 19th century. They were a breakaway Quaker movement actually, immigrants from England, 
and they were called shakers in a slightly derogatory way because of their communal and religious inspired dances. Not exactly whirling dervishes, but sufficiently odd for mainstream Victorian society to regard them as slightly strange. Simplicity, self-sufficiency and communal living were fundamental to these shaker communities, which functioned as little villages. But it was abstinence from sex that ensured that all they would leave behind would be their buildings, spaces and crafts. These two ladies were the last surviving members and I don't think they were dancing very much. <laughs> but the Shakers, however, had an aesthetic which would have a predictable revival in the late 20th century. And you can see the appeal of this simplicity. Incidentally, these, these rails and things hanging on them were because um, nothing was supposed to be left lying around. When you finished sitting, you could put the chair on the wall. This was not a self-indulgent society. And this was the book that I did, and it was commissioned by one of the great publishing art directors and someone who became a good friend, uh, David Larkin. Um, now, I'm not going to try and make any facile connections between Shaker rooms, which were austere, as you can see, and Japanese chashitsu. But you could see why the photographic appeal of something like this would also attract me to this. But this isn't exactly why or how the book happened. It rather crept up on me by surprise. And um, for... A year and a half around the year 2000, um, I was shooting a book that was to be called Japan Modern, and the subject was New Japanese Houses. Now, surprisingly, at the time, there was no such book, just architectural trade <coughs> magazines. But in the wake of the bursting of the Japanese economic bubble, a new generation of architects and some designers started to rethink the principles of Japanese architecture. People like Ban Shigeru, Kengo Kuma, uh, Kazuo Sejime and Ryo Nishizawa, many of them were looking back to Japan's long craft traditions to see how they could repurpose these for the modern world. As in this uh, quite well-known uh, building, the M House by Sejime and Nishizawa. Inevitably, Actually being able to realise these ideas meant, meant for the, the architects finding private clients of some means. So these were not average houses. And it meant that many of the clients actually had room for a chashitsu and the cultural interest also to want one. This is where it became interesting for me as a photographer because the architects and designers that I was working with were all imaginative and they all had their own philosophies and architectural agendas. And naturally, they didn't want just to reproduce traditional chashitsu like this to the usual well-established and rather rigid formulae. They wanted to express themselves. In other words, do their own version. And in house after house, about a third of the ones that I was shooting for this project, I was intrigued and fascinated by, well, characterful tea spaces. Um, this is called Ichijuan. All tea ceremony, all chashitsu have names. Right? Um, and it's by Shigeru Uchida um, at the Mojiko Hotel on Kyushu. Uh, the hotel was designed by Aldo Rossi. And Uchida went on to experiment more with chashitsu. And what inspired him here was the idea of reducing and simplifying while at the same time making use of more modern materials like frosted glass. He worked, as he put it, in the belief that the true features of an object are revealed by simplification. And the cover of the book came from this house in Sakuragaoka, uh, designed by uh, Kunihiko Hayakawa. He created a tea ceremony room in what he calls an apparatus embedding a cylinder into the structure of the building. 
and the tea ceremony room occupies the upper part. And he designed the room in primary colours. And in place of the tokonoma, the, the alcove, um, which is the focal point uh, in many ways of, of, of this kind of room, there's simply a polished metal floor section um, with perforated metal. And the preparation area, the misuya, is converted from part of the roof terrace outside. And the two glass panels form part of a, a low wall that rotate on hinges to form a table. So a lot of imaginative structural thought had gone into this. Now access is in the form of uh, a tubular steel ladder, which can be raised and lowered by means of a wire block pulley. Because one of the... I'm, I'm not... I'm not going to either embarrass myself or bore you with explaining how a traditional uh, chashitsu should work, but one of the features is an extremely small entrance, uh, which translates as wriggling in entrance, the idea being that it makes you humble because you have to uh, crouch down and work your way in. And this was Kayakawa's uh, equivalent. Um, and because it's on a pulley, you can lift it up, so it also offers a, a sort of isolation. Now, given that the tea ceremony and the space in which it takes place is extraordinarily formal and particular, you might think that this kind of thing was rather brave, if not foolhardy. And it's true up to a point, but there are two other dynamics at work. And one is that, in a sense, the cha offers a kind of blank canvas of a space, despite all the traditional strictures. Now, I need to be careful about the words I use here, but in the context of a house, it has none of the normal functions. It's not like a kitchen, bathroom, living room, even study. Now, there are, of course, Japanese rooms that look like chashitsu, but are more informal. But these are washitsu, not so bound by formal constraints. And I was less interested in them, even though there were some very imaginative ones that I did for another book, like this circular structure. And this. Anyway, um, that wasn't what I was really concentrating on. With the chashitsu, because it has none of the normal living functions of a house, and no utilities needed, other than the supply of water, there's intrinsically a, a, an amount of freedom for the architect. And the second dynamic I found even more interesting. Well, I mean, hipster is probably not the first word that comes to mind to do with the Japanese way of tea and the chashitsu. But as one of the designers whose work is featured here said, when Senna Rikyu created his humble style of tea room, it was a direct challenge to the established order and the preference for the expensive, elaborate and beautiful that held sway at the time. Inevitably, though, what began as an overhaul of tea aesthetics became, again, the established order, with as many rules and restrictions for the tea room as for the practice of the ceremony held in it. At the same time, its relevance to modern Japanese city life has diminished greatly. And this sort of untethering has inspired a growing number of new architects and interior designers to treat the chashitsu as a working space in which to develop new ideas. A sort of contemporary version of what the 16th century tea masters did. So this experimentation actually began um, in 1983 when an architect, uh, Arata Isozaki, contributed drawings to the Leo Castelli Gallery in New York, which was planning an exhibit of follies, international follies. Um, and he decided that, um, a space, as he put it, a space for a non-functional tea ceremony is similar to a folly. So he produced these drawings. And years later, 10 years later, in 92, he was commissioned to actually bring it to reality as this modern chashitsu which he called Ujian, and it's in Shinagawa. And in particular, he introduced a range of new materials, including titanium, stainless steel, concrete, etched glass. 
and made a special point of, of contrast between what he saw as strong, flat, horizontal surfaces and curving feminine verticals. <clears throat> but for many of the, I mean, well, not but and, for many of the architects and designers who followed this Sazaki, the key was materiality. Choosing material as a theme um, has run through quite a number of these. And it was, from the beginning, the hallmark of the work of Kengo Kuma, um, now one of the most famous uh, Japanese architects. And one of, the, one of his earliest and most spectacular buildings was uh, the water glass house built in Atami. And in the year 2000, when I was starting the book, he was commissioned to build a kind of stone museum in Tochigi Prefecture for a client who quarried the local andesite. And he was looking for ways of making it light, uh, what he calls weak architecture. And his answer was a, this kind of louvered wall. The site also contained some old small warehouses, which were traditional and solid. And uh, he couldn't do anything with the outside of those, but to continue this theme of making things, uh, making the stone lighter, um, he took one of them um, to make out of it an experimental chashitsu. For the rest of the area, what he had to do was experiment with new cutting techniques um, to make thin slices of stone. And he put this to use here, creating these thin slats. More than that, that they were treated by subjecting them to extremes of heat, which alters the colour. The, the precise hue of, of this volcanic stone depends on the temperature. So combining it with sliding shoji screens and a raised floating tatami floor with underlighting, uh, the result was the lightness that he was looking for. Another experiment in materials was the use of steel, and some of it rusted, or well, partly oxidised. And here in Osaka by, um, uh, I've forgotten the name of the architect, but it's in the book. Um, and it's called, appropriately enough, Tetsuo no Chashitsu, which simply means the steel sheet tea room. Um, here's another case. In one of the oldest temples in the historic town of Kawagoi, i pronounce pronounced that right, um, uh, Architect Ken Yokogawa won a competition to install a tea room that had to blend old and new within the grounds of the temple. So um, he used etched glass walls, one of them creating what's essentially a backlit tokonoma, the alcove, and laid over with specially designed handmade Japanese rice paper. And he used aluminium and glass for the entrance and a Brazilian hardwood as a, as a kind of open work roof um, because the existing trees had to be left, so he simply cut circular holes uh, for them. The, the final stepping stone, there's always one for a tea stone room where you take your shoes off, is actually of sheets of baked frosted glass that have been layered and then finely chiseled. So you can see a lot of these people are just are, are experimenting with materials. Um, and this, I particularly like, the, the sukkabai, the, the stone water basin. You basically cut it in half vertically and then reassembled it, sandwiching a, a thick sheet of glass. The theme here in open farmland near Narita Airport is sustainable low energy architecture using glass and rough wood. And these four large greenhouses enclose an echo village with small raised dwelling units in wood, and the project's called Millennium City. The architect, uh, Hiroshi Iguchi, made one of these units into a, into a tea house. And the box construction of the unit with its, these braces is in Japanese cedar, and replacing the, the normal paper shoji screens, acrylic panels. another with another material paper. This is called, this room is called Seifuan and the architect is Atsushi Kitagawara. Kitagawara. Yeah. Um, and it's in Sendagaya. Um, he built this tea ceremony room for his own use 
um, in a kind of modern free-form version of what he still considered the Sukhya humble style, um, using natural materials, chief of which is hand-laid washi paper, crumpled and rolled. And the ceiling is covered entirely with these paper, with the paper rolled around bamboo tubes. And there's neither a tokonoma nor a hanging scroll painting, as he and his wife preferred a sort of relaxed and informal style of tea ceremony. So his idea was to place against one wall uh, whatever he thought would be appropriate for his guests. And this is where I learned something important about the tea ceremony that I hadn't quite realised before, because I'd always seen it as something very daunting and you get your wrist slapped if you turn the cup the wrong way around and things like that. Knowing that I was coming to photograph it, he, he insisted on, he and his wife, preparing a tea ceremony for, for me. And so he spent quite some time thinking about what to place in this sort of blank tokonoma. So instead of a scroll, he chose a framed print by a photographer friend of his. Um, and I, I was very, very touched by that. And I suddenly realized that there's, there's more, there was more to the tea ceremony than, than just going through rules. It's very much about hospitality. Um, and I came to learn a, a phrase, Ichigo Ichie, which is one time, one meeting. It's never going to happen again. Um, the person you've invited, this moment, is unique. So I, I, I was very touched by that. Anyway, back to materials. Aluminium um, became almost, well, actually an obsession for uh, designer Toshihiko Suzuki, who became a friend, uh, beginning with his atelier in the countryside of Yamagata. It extends to an old Airstream trailer, which he used as the, uses the, uh, the mizuya, the preparation space, uh, for his aluminium shashitsu, which uses aluminium honeycomb. These are two solid sheets sandwiching a honeycomb core. Um, and the result was this, so on. Um, which seemed to have been simple in the form of a cube. And this is, this is the, the room that graces the cover of our book. It, there's concealed interior lighting and it's computer controlled so that it cycles up and down while daylight filters through the, the circular holes. Anyway. That was pretty conventional, actually, compared with what he went on to next, um, which was the idea of a sort of large, flat suitcase, um, just about portable. Now, this, this in fact, wasn't, uh, this first example was not uh, for the tea ceremony, but it, it unfolds to reveal a tatami mat and traditional igusa straw, um, and we can see it in work here. So he used the same honeycomb um, aluminium for, uh, for strength. And here's one of his assistants. I, I mean, you might wonder how she actually carried it into the woods. Well, we all helped. <laughs> um, but this is how you put it together. Um, and this was basically a sort of meditation space. So it, and it had quite a complex structural arrangement of these aluminium tubes um, and elasticated shock cords, um, which are then erected to, um, to produce four triangular cells with a sort of light ceiling. And the superstructure, believe it or not, is based on Buckminster Fuller's tensegrity principle, in which tension is used, for, is used primarily and compression secondarily. That's the way Suzuki explained it to me, and I didn't quite understand, but never mind. But the result was obviously quite useful. Um, but he took this idea and then extended it to make a slightly larger version that would actually function as a portable tea ceremony room. Um, completely functional, by the way, for one tea master and one guest, as you will see. And there we go. 
If this seems a little weird, well, it is weird, but it's really weird. <laughs> Suzuki actually says, it actually said, but the original Chashitsu were indeed portable. They could be disassembled and moved. So they were the earliest examples of architectural furniture, in his way of seeing it, um, which is the area of ambiguity, he said, that I'm exploring here. Well, good. Um, but portability is a theme also explored by veteran designer Shigeru Uchida with this structure called Sankyo, uh, meaning in the mountains. This was, this was the sort of launch party for it, the, the vernissage, if you like. So I didn't actually get it to see it, to see it in the mountains. And this is the fifth of his portable series. Uh, it's made of bamboo mesh supported by a frame of Japanese ash, stained black. And he calls it movable architecture. And also, it, it, with the materials, it straddles the border between inside and outside, which is um, a, an area of fascination that many Japanese architects have. Now, I keep, I've been talking about the tokonoma, um, uh, which is traditionally an alcove, key focal point for a tea room. And in particular, should be featuring a flower arrangement and a hanging scroll. So remember the first chashit so I showed you in the cover of the book, the book in blue, red and yellow, where that was replaced just by a small flooring of polished aluminium. So for modern versions, it almost always comes under scrutiny by the designer or architect, uh, because he's having to deal with this uh, essentially very traditional focal point. Um, so here, Uchida just used a small image of a horse. But there were, there were some more experimental approaches. Now, in this house in Osaka, the, this is by a team. Uh, the architect said Chitoshi Kihara, but he works a lot with a garden designer, uh, Yasijiro Aoki, who's a friend. They often work together. And they devise a very different approach. Their argument was that the scroll painting for the tokonoma should be chosen with great care. Remember how in the one that I attended, a lot of thought had gone into producing something that I would like, the photograph. But also, should be changed with the season. Now, the, at Kihara's idea, there, there isn't really time in modern city life to attend to all these things very easily. So instead, they made the view through the drawn back shoji screens as the equivalent of a scroll. So th this is how it works with the trough outside of these black pebbles uh, and with a plant arrangement at the far end and a small mound of larger stones close to the camera. And here's the view from the other end. And as you can see, the trough can be filled with water at the flick of a switch. Well, you just have to wait about half an hour to fill up, but still it's easy enough to do. And easily empty. So the idea is to allow a kind of change of landscape that takes the place of seasonal change. But let's go further. Another creative approach to a traditional idea involves the, the old garden concept of borrowed landscape. Um, you, it's, a, it's a slightly complicated story before we get to the tokenoma, but please bear with me. Uh, borrowed landscape, Jijing in Chinese, Shake in Japanese. It originated in China, and here's one very well-known example in the city of Suzhou. Uh, this is uh, Zhu Zheng Yuan, the, the humble administrator's garden, which is probably the most famous of the, of the old gardens in the city, built in 1509. Um, and it uses the Besa uh, North Temple pagoda um, as part of the design, it borrows it in. It's exactly one kilometer dif distant. Now, this idea of borrowed landscape um, it, it is fascinating. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to do nowadays because you don't have much control over um, what's happening in the distance. Um, next year, there might be a wind farm. And that, that could certainly spoil your garden design. But um, we did come across a very imaginative one um, and in Okinawa, and it's called the Watergate House. And it was designed by a combination of the owner 
um, and the architect. The architect, young guy, Tetsuo Goto. The, the owner, pretty, pretty well-known theatre and film director called Amon Minamoto. And they, the idea was to choose a view that wasn't going to be messed around with by the municipality or anyone else. Um, and that was, that was really easy to find in Okinawa um, and easy to buy um, land for building on, on the coast because, um, because of the typhoons, no one in their right mind builds on the coast. But the inspiration for the house was this view of the seashore. And Mino, uh, Minamoto being uh, a theatre director, he, he conceived the idea of a proscenium. So, uh, because of the, 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 the way the, the, the bedding of the seashore is, is quite shallow, and it's rock, and extends, uh, extends out a long way um, when the tide's down, the view's constantly changing. And of course, key to this is this, this rock in front. Um, and it looks, you know, just like a rock, but actually it's quite a large boulder um, out in the sea. Um, and so when the guests actually stand, get up and, and walk out, it, it becomes a, a, a surprising experience. But, but uh, Minamoto and, and, and Goto weren't finished there because they decided also to use this for the tea room, but in a different way. As a th Minamoto is a the theatrical director, but he explained that he was taken with the idea of a priest opening and closing a sliding door to, re to, to, to reveal briefly a view beyond. And as a child, he'd always wanted to, have to like the idea of a tea ceremony room that, that actually looked out. So this is what they did. They sighted the room to the right of the main living area. And it's in concrete, roofless concrete. And they made a narrow window so that um, they, you just see the water and the slope of the rock. Um, and so, just to labour the point, excuse me, it's a real life version of uh, a Shan Shui. Uh, uh, mountain water landscape, which would traditionally hang in the Tokonoma, either that or calligraphy. Um, and the ledge in front, coated in red lacquer, just had a, a single, a shallow circular depression, uh, and the flower arrangement is always a single floating bloom. I thought that was quite lovely. I'm going to finish with one of my favourite Japanese architects, uh, Teronobu Fujimori. Um, in fact, he began not as an architect, but as a teacher. He was professor of architectural hist history at Todai. And this, which is called the Nero House, which means, it, tr it translates literally as Li, but actually it's, it's Chinese chives. It's the, it's the ones that go into Gyoza. Um, and this was an early work of his, and it incorporated a, a chashitsu on the right there. Um, and he designed it for a, his friend, an uh, artist and novelist called Genpei Akasagawa. Uh, and between them, they came up with the idea of planting a thousand pots of chives on the roof, um, which caused quite a quite complex system of irrigation under the wooden roof. And as for the chashitsu, it has its own quirkiness because the roof is firewood. And not only that, but it was entirely assembled by the architect, the owner, and a group of friends in one day. And they made an installation event out of it. The, now, the, the wriggling in entrance um, is particularly difficult and precarious. It's just under the eaves of the main living area. Uh, and the, that's quite high, by the way. It's slightly dangerous. Um, but after this came Kuan. This is a construction for a small temple in Kyoto. And originally, this corner, in the far corner there, uh, had an outside toilet. But once a new flush lavatory had been built inside the temple, the resident priest, Hitoshi Akino, who unfortunately recently died, asked Fujimori, who was a friend, to design a tea house which he, the priest, would actually build himself. And he did. 
And this was, this was the result. He, Fujimura had the idea of a sort of perched construction, like a, a small tea house, a tree house rather, using a, a branch and forks of a chestnut tree from his own hometown. So the result is a kind of sort of elven construction. It wouldn't really look out of place in Tolkien's Middle Earth. <laughs> But he, he then later took this further, and this is the last uh, picture I'm going to show you. Um, uh, and it, it, this, this became Fujimori's signature building, which he, which he called, not entirely tongue-in-cheek, uh, Takasugeyan, which roughly translates as too high, the too high tea house. Um, and it's in his native Chino in Nagano prefecture. And, and it deliberately sways in the wind. As he puts it, it's his hideout in the treetops. So with that, I will, I can see that I've run over slightly. Um, I, I will now attempt to answer any questions. But if anyone asks me anything technical about either the way of tea or, or the way these things should be built, I'm afraid I will deflect the answer.